Bye, everyone. You can see people coming in. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm just going to wait a minute or two, as uh, as is usual, to while people arrive and um, and get settled in. Uh, thank you for choosing to start your Friday nights with us. Um, and do say hi in the chat box as well. Um, uh, let us know who you are, um, where you're watching from. Always nice to get a sense of who's here. Uh, and James, can you see the chat? Because I, I can't, I can't oh, see. Oh, you can't see the chat, can you, Lena? Mm -hmm. I can see the chat. Um, Lydia Harris oh, is here. Can, yes. Here we go, from Orkney. Hello, Lydia, Regi, Regine, hello, Hannah, hi. We, we've already got, got good coverage with Orkney and Cheshire. Um, <clears throat> Montreal, okay, we're going big. We're international, <clears throat> leave it there. Um, hi, Valerie. Lovely. Wivenhoe, Essex, I think Jen might be in Essex, uh, one of our readers. Hi, Kathleen. Essex contingent. Hi, Julia. Um, lovely. And use the chat throughout as well. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we'll use that as sort of a Q&A function. Um, so if you've got any any questions uh, for Zaina or any of the other poets uh, as they come up, do type them in there. And at the end, um, I'll be able to scroll back and see it. There is a Q&A uh, function as well, an official Q&A function. If you would prefer to use that, please do. Uh, and that gets sent straight to me, I think. Um, and I can read it out, um, read anything out. And show your appreciation for the poets in, in any way you choose. I'm a big fan of the uh, of the applause reaction that just demonstrated. Um, OK, uh, I think the people have slowed down coming in now. So um, let's get started properly. Uh, so hello and um, welcome to the launch uh, on publication week of In the Name is Red by Zedar Ghani. There's great things with the color of my camera there. <laughs> um, my name is James. I am the maternity cover director of the Emma Press, uh, the publisher of this pamphlet of poems. Um, in case you don't know about us, we are a Birmingham-based publisher of poetry and prose for adults and children. Um, we were founded by Emma Diane Wright in 2012 with the aim of making literature and publishing as welcoming and as accessible as possible. I um, should say we are open to submissions twice a year, which is where we found us. And we publish about eight to 10 books annually. Uh, I am thrilled that this is our third book of 2024, our second poetry pamphlet in a busy year for them. Um, and it's this beautiful debut from Zedar Ghani, Zaina. Um, this maternity period that I'm, I've got covering Emma uh, has sort of informally rolled over a bit. Um, so Emma's coming back one day a week. Uh, but it means that I'm seeing the publication of the books that sort of on the desk when I arrived in January last year in a sort of shortlist pile. Um, we selected three manuscripts from that, I think. And Zaina's really like immediately stood out to me as an incredibly honed piece of work, I would say. Um, poets often ask us kind of what we want to see in submissions, which is actually really quite hard to specify because you want to be surprised, of course you want to be engaged, um, but there's something particularly compelling in feeling like a poet knows exactly what they're doing. Um, they sort of take on a journey within the poems, uh, but also across the pamphlet as a whole. And that's what really leapt out to me with Zayna's work, uh, which I think is actually very varied, um, perhaps more so than uh, other pamphlets, which are uh, sometimes really thematic. Um, but this kind of like, echo that Zaina has, these kind of flashes of red, um, repeated words, 
and kind of ghosts of images that reoccur really made a lasting impression. Um, so yeah, and then to find out when it was a debut, this kind of really brilliantly honed piece of work uh, was a debut pamphlet made um, Zane's achievement all the more impressive, I think. Um, so I'm particularly thrilled to still be here to launch it with Zaina tonight. Um, I hope you have your copies already. Uh, I know lots of you have ordered from our website. Um, we will buy one soon. I'll, I'll put a link on there. I'm holding it, but it's a beautiful edition designed by an artist, Louise Weir. Uh, it's got some illustrations in it. Um, and of course the poems, which are packed with like rich language and striking images of nature and religion and faith and family um, dotted through with jewels. And I would say just a healthy amount of madness too. Um, so <laughs> I am delighted to say that Zane is here with us, obviously, to read from and talk about the book. We've got two special guest readers, Jennifer Rose and Rhea Powell, to share some of their work for us and help us celebrate in the name of Red. Um, but I think I have chatted long enough. It'd be great to get Zaina on. Um, maybe you could share a poem to start us off and say a few words. Um, a massive congratulations, first of all, on this pamphlet. And thank you for trusting us and sending us your work. Um, uh, this is a debut, but I was wondering, because I do think it is incredibly honed. How long were you, were you working on these poems, do you think? Um, um, I'm fairly new to poetry. Um, I've mm, write, been writing for just a couple of years, really. A few, yeah, a few years. Um, I was lucky because um, as soon as I, I started uh, submitting my poems, I, I found uh, I, I, one of the first magazines I submitted to was uh, Black Bar Poetry. And that's how I got in contact with, with Matthew M.C. Smith, who is an amazing poet himself. And he he really believed in my work and he encouraged me to write more. He asked me to be uh, a featured poet on uh, his Black Bow Poetry website. And yeah, that kind of helped me to to believe in, in myself and in, in my in my writing. And um, shortly after that, I was writing poems that would be part of, would be in this collection. Um, but at the start, it wasn't about red at all. It was just kind of, I was just writing about the things I loved and, and that's, uh, you know, books, literary characters that I just love reading, you know, Jane Eyre, which a book that changed my life. Um, Estella, great ex from Great Expectations and Alice in Wonderland. I wrote about the myth of Hades and Persephone because that's always been a, you know a fascinating myth for me you know um the story of abduction and love and you know mother there's motherhood in there and you know there's uh, all sorts of power struggles in that story and it's very dramatic and it's so inspiring um yeah and I was also in my life, I was dealing with a lot of um, hardship, I suppose, with my family. And uh, I wrote about that too. And that's why this collection is kind of divided in three almost. It's about family. It's about literary characters. Um, and, you know, it's just about nature and colour and everything. Um, so, yeah, it's just... It's just yeah, a mixture of things, but the, the, those themes also overlap a lot. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely they do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I definitely. I'm rereading it again as well. Um, yeah. You see these, exactly. If you said that it was about those those three sort of topics, you definitely see that, but then they're all, all in, interwoven into each other. So brilliant. Um, I, I wonder if you'd just let's start by reading as a poem and yes. kicking the night that would be that'd be lovely yeah. sure um the first poem i'd like to read is red is red it's the first poem in the collection 
Um, yes, it's it's written in in the voice of red, you know, and this this color is it just wants to be at the forefront of everything. It's greedy. You know, I just imagine what what red would sound like if it was a person, and it's just you know egotistical and uh, you know attention seeking. You know, and this is this is it. Red is red. <clears throat> be a darling and imagine the reddest of all reds, changeable in velvet, a usurper in broadcloth, smooching the ground cheek to cheek in Louboutins. I'm here, I'm always here, itching to breathe, vital under your skin, trumpeted by pulse. I need to exist as the poison arrows target, dirty on the warrior's face. A flag rippling like a dragon overhead. You wish you could know my names, all secret, sacred and true. But call me whatever you want, I don't care. Or summon me as rose, claret, vermilion. Ladies blush, lust, evoke me from ruddy, madder, Brazil wood, orchil, cochineal, uricum. I need to exist, for no other colour in two lengths of cloth makes a gentleman and keeps him that way. And there's nothing I can't improve with a cat with a scandal though I'm happiest reclining on a girl's pretty lips, pitying potential left to rot, lesser reds that shall but one day bloom into me if they dare. Know me as a fiesta in everything I star in. I tickle a tree and it's autumn. I tap someone and they blush. I storm into a battlefield and it's a field of poppies all the time living my best life as I always will me Shakti dancing like a graceful madwoman in the flames of a star roaring myself redder yes it's possible and charging back down to earth in the Pope's fresh socks, diving into a dazzling Diwali of fireflies as they, for a flare and sigh, jaunt through my impermanent soul. But I need to exist. Shed me, if you must, on your wedding night. Sari cloth, petticoat, silk, blouse swaying with the bed or pin me as a bindi on your third eye like a sun so when they look at you they'll see me first exalted how fortunate i am to be a color let alone red so good Thank you. I, I didn't bring up that you're resplendent in red yourself tonight as well, which is highly appropriate. Um, uh, no, kind of unforgivable that I don't own anything red uh, to match you, but um, uh, thank you for that, which is a lovely intro to the book uh, and, and to the night. Um, we'll move on to our, our support readers for the night. I wonder if you um, would maybe just uh, say a bit about why you asked Jen and Ria to to read tonight. Yes, um, so uh, I've written a an intro for both of them. Uh, so Jen uh, is the color is the, is the author of the Color of Hope. She is a former Foil Young Poet of the Year and has been published in regional and national journals and anthologies. I admire Jen's ability to write about happiness in an authentic way that doesn't feel forced or overdone. 
She explores family, nature, motherhood, shedding a golden light over the little moments we take for granted. Her writing is comforting, uplifting, and exudes life and laughter. I love the way she uses color. It's animated and joyous in her poems. She relates it to emotion and memory, good memories. And second guest is Ria Powell. I met Ria at the Where We Find, Find Ourselves anthology launch in 2021, published by Arachne Press, and she had an amazing presence. I was absorbed and inspired by her reading. She is a British-born poet of Indian heritage from a community with a rich history of migration. Migration is a theme she explores extensively, analysing its effects on identity and language. Her poetic voice is powerful and multisensory. She is the author of Roots, published by Arachne Press. She won the Creative Future Writers Award in 2021, and her poem Salutation was highly commended in the 2023 Forward Prize. Yeah. Wow, uh, fantastic. That was a lovely intro. I'm not going to say anything else then, um, because that was too nice um, and personal. Uh, Let's go for Jen first, if you'd love to um, come up on camera and I'll spotlight you. Hi, Jen. Hello. Welcome. Um, Take it away. Thank you very much. Zaina, that was such a lovely intro. Um, I now have to read in a way that will live up to that. Um, that was really, really kind of you. Thank you very much. Um, and hello, everyone. It's really lovely to be here. Um, I thought I should also wear some red. Yes, James, you must immediately go shopping and buy red accessories, at least, um, for future launches like this. Um, I'm going to read a few poems, a mixture of some brand new ones and some stuff that's coming out um, fairly soon. Um, this first one is called The Four of Us in August. This is friendship like a jersey dress, comfortable and smart with deep pockets. The children are finally sleeping, sprawled long-limbed and ringleted across the big bed. Outside, the four of us scrape garden chairs closer to the fire pit, slosh more of the good wine into our glasses. Owls glimmer in the trees, the moors are within touching distance. We're talking careers, future shaping, mapping our collective middle age, the same slightly outraged expression mirrored on each of our faces. We're mopping the last of the oil from our plates with crusts of bread. Now the fire is like water lapping against the memory of wood. We watch the sparks climb, feeling special and ancient as stars. Later in bed, my skin smells pleasingly of smoke. Um, I seem to be writing a lot about either sort of childhood memories and teenage memories or swinging into kind of the world of adulting and how hard it is a lot of the time. I write a lot about motherhood and responsibility and uh, all sorts of feeling like you're getting it wrong all the time. Um, but uh, there's a lot of nostalgia that creeps into my work and this is sort of a key example of that so this one's called something like nostalgia after he died they turned his shop into a flat lace curtains filmy enough to peer through a legacy of sticky fingers on the glass god years ago we used to queue out the door and down towards the square jostling in first uniforms first glints of pocket money white knuckled jars and jars and jars on shelves that needed kickstools a library of gobstoppers and pear drops Sour apples, cola cubes, orbs in every colour. I remember his moustache. I remember him in a surgeon's white coat. Can that be right? Other people used to buy shoe polish and nails and milk, the trappings of adulthood we refused to understand. The butchers went next, and the greengrocers on the corner soon after. The village now seems thronged with ghosts, sweets and trust chickens and innocent children and bunches of carrots still smelling faintly of earth. Um, you'd think that I might have put this together in the order that I wanted to read them, but apparently not. So excuse me while I now flail around finding what I want to read next. Um, I think I'll do, I'll do this one next. This one um, 
came second in the magma competition last year which i'm still completely boggled about um and it's a little one called boxing day swimmers it's the strangest thing lately i open my mouth and my mother falls out a mournful clockwork wood pigeon on the kitchen table after lunch we drag the children along the seafront my god let me be like those women bobble hatted and wobbling towards high tide those women, salt brined, making joyous hams of their bodies. On delicate, brittle days, bring me to the shore. Show me how to punch the cold right in the centre of its stupid face. Um, this next one is going to be in, I have a, a pamphlet coming out with nine pens in the summer, which is very much about motherhood and was mostly written in lockdown which is when my son was born um which was an experience um and this one is called the fourth trimester and will be in that pamphlet that's coming out later this year the fourth trimester these first weeks are uncharted and you are adrift in seas the same color and temperature as tears and you are weightless with exhaustion in the water the scope of need making hollow driftwood of your bones all your past selves floating out of reach, clumps of green, unfettered seaweed. Slowly, you are discerning shorelines and horizons in the dark, and slowly you are swimming. And the waters bloom with jellyfish, vicious moon bodies lit with guilt and resentment and doubt, and you are fire-branded, but you are swimming. And then there are shallows, there are footholds. There are others like you, crawling stunned and stung onto the shingle, there is a sunrise cresting the waves, tongues of flame in your hair. Slowly you stand, you stand and pass the bright certainty of dawn along this beach like a beacon, mother to mother to mother. Um, I have two more if that's okay. Um, I'm not used to doing this when I can't see other people, so I have no idea what's going on. It feels like I'm talking into a very lovely void. Um, so apologies. Um, but this is one I really love what Zaina does with literary characters that have inspired her. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll hear some of those poems a bit later. Um, but I have a, a series of, of poems inspired by children's books. Um, and I thought I would do one of those this evening in honour of uh, the name of Red. I was trying to find some red poems and I don't seem to have managed that. So you can have some some green poems coming up instead. Um, so this is called Irreconcilable Differences. Looking back now at the way this whole mess was immortalized, the first thing I take issue with is the color. An easy rhythm for a man who has never seen a pea, who has never spent a night on a rough sea, who has never felt fur and feathers salt clumped, this sudden unwelcome weight. That boat was the color of regret, that's all, the color of haste. We went to see how easy it is to say. Ignore the clamour of angry voices, the teeth at our heels. The honey lay thick on our tongues. When there was finally a moon to steer by, it looked hollow. I remember standing on the edge of the sand with the trees tolling behind us. I remember the strangeness of wattle and squawk, the cold eyes of the forest hogs. When I think of him now, it's talon and spite. But I remember him singing. Yes, that much at least is true. Um, and then I have one last one, which I wasn't planning on reading, but Zaina said such lovely things about this book that I felt like I should. Um, so this is from The Clara of Hope and it is uh, a green poem. So this collection, I hope I'm not going to run out of time by talking about this. Um, this came about again in lockdown through uh, asking people it started off with asking friends and then it kind of expanded out through Instagram into people that I didn't know um, asking them to give me three things that they could guarantee would make them feel happy and I would take those three things and combine them and turn them into a poem um, and so each one's written for an individual but the themes and the things that came out of it are really beautifully universal as well and after I'd done about 20 I started thinking oh goodness I think there's a book in here um, and this is the end result and I think it works outside of lockdown as well I hope it works outside of lockdown anyway so um, this one is called For Charlotte who is a lovely artist friend of mine um, Last night I dreamed a forest had sprung up around me the tomato plants huge and cascading from the mantelpiece spreading tendrils that smelled of all things good 
of grandparents' glass houses and damp soil and the throbbing heart of summertime. Roses and dahlias covered the dining table and crept across the floor in a louche, perfumed sprawl. Thick vines of bramble pressed against the windows, desperate to deposit their gifts in my lap, to leave wine-dark stains on my dress. Upstairs in the studio, I could feel the pencils jostling against the lid of the box, greens thirsty with wanting. From my small clearing in this unexpected woodland, I sensed the whispers of juniper, spruce and sap, the spicy chuckle of cedar, the gossip of olive and moss. And through the thicket of stems and fronds, I heard snippets and jigsaw pieces of conversation. Laughter I recognised, the echo of my name, a flash of sunlit wine in a raised glass. I could have parted the leaves, could have wandered through the creepers in search of company. Instead, I sat in the sudden jungle of my living room, eating squares of chocolate dark enough to need tasting notes. Leather, tobacco, red berries, laughing at the wildness of the world. Thank you very much. Oh, that was so good. Thank you, Jen. We're going to move straight on to Ria and, and hear some more wonderful poems. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Such a joy to be here. Really enjoyed those readings, Jen and Zena. I've just been delighting in in your pamphlet. I, I loved how you described red as being like a greedy colour. Um, and I, I think in some ways, like, it's a really daring colour to choose for a pamphlet. And I felt like the the language really ju does justice to that. And I think, as you mentioned, um, some of these references, especially to like South Asian culture and heritage um, and the color red, but also this like thickness and greed of having so much culture and being able to pour it into the page um, in such a lyrical way. Um, it's just, yeah, it's been a really stunning read and I feel really um, excited and grateful to be able to share um, and, and read some poems alongside you tonight. Um, I picked a couple of poems from, one from my book, Roots, um, and one which is a newer piece that both kind of have some touching on the, on the ideas of color. Um, so this first one that I'll read is called Enough. My grandmother houses gods in her closet among tower blocks of cereal boxes and canned chickpeas, so we may always know enough. She stews landscapes with the windows closed, wills the extractor fan to take her home. Generations drift, climbing ladders that raise you as an only child. Language limps ashamed in the mouth. We fill silence with sucker and gleaming jewels of pomegranate. Love is a miner's purple hands, for we have lost the words for indigo and magenta. Lust and rage are faded characters. At the margins, I find her at the post office, queuing for stamps, returning lyrics to the radio, Songs of abundance heard on the static, some place even she has forgotten. Lord, how do I cross this abyss? We did not brave the seas, sever the limb of belonging for this. To whom can I confess? I am grateful, but this is not enough. Bring me the ragas. Bring me the mirrored midnight kumar. Bring me kavali under the heat of the marigold sun. Um, this next poem I'm going to read is called um, At Adaba Dal is Frying. We reach the sacred city waning, our bellies blunt with night. The streets are never quiet, but the sounds are far away behind the backs of gullies thick with dung and pooling dark. We help each other over hills of sleeping cows, beaches of rubble, 
camp pyres of plastic that leave our eyes starched before we reach the road. Blurring lights of a scooter gush past, far away, men are shouting. At Daba, Dal is frying, in spitting mustard seed and whole red chilies. A man holds an onion like the moon in one hand, granting wishes of dal fry and jeera rice. We dust our palms on our dubattas, curl the warmth onto our fingers, urge riches into our gaping mouths before the plate soaks and folds and disappears. Two feet away, a vat of dal steams on a sighing flame hides its creator from view. Who else has eaten from his hands today? Who else knows the fragrance in our fingers? And this final poem I'll read um, is a newer one and actually it's not one I've read to an audience before. Um, the title of the poem is in the middle of the poem. So I'm not gonna tell you what it is because I think it would, um, yeah, I think it would kind of like break the flow. Um, but I think that's kind of a nice little riddle um, for you as an audience. Um, maybe I'll tell you at the end. I had known for some time, this was not how we were supposed to live. Beating the walls with a blunt spoon, begging the light to break in. Sometimes you just have to grab the sun and run. That afternoon, I held a peach against the sky, watched the mountains crawl. You and I, we grew up on the same stories, Poseidon and the trident, the snake and the apple, Newton and his space-time, show me your gods and I will show you mine. That afternoon, I let a stink bug slink curious along the branch of my arm, found a blueprint of the world on her back, stroking her armour, a surrendering fortress, terrain in motion, land becoming lover. All motion is metaphor. I kept a secret from this world as a child and have been estranged ever since. I bind my wrists in red ribbon, paint the mountains on my knees so my body knows its place. I am always surprised to return to a room and find things as I left them. When objects learnt to sit still, what became of the warmth that was lost? We, the seekers, gather songs in protest. I prefer to believe that cities dance in my absence, recompose when they hear my becoming. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Ria. Um, incredible stuff from both uh, support acts. Uh, really inspiring. Um, uh, Zaina gave such good introductions to them. I will give uh, Zaina one as well, and then we'll hear, hear you read some poems from In the Name of Red. Um, so, Zed Argani is from London. She graduated with a BA in Creative Writing from Bath Spa University in 2012. Her poems, which explore themes of identity, femininity, religion, and nature, have been published in literary journals such as Magma, Black Bow Poetry, and The Adriatic. In 2021, her collection of poems was shortlisted in the Poetry Wales pamphlet competition. Um, I'm delighted to say that In the Name of Red is her debut pamphlet uh, out now with the Emma Press. Over to you, Zane. And you were on mute. <laughs> Somebody had to be. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, thank you so much to Jen and Ria for those amazing, amazing readings. Um, the first poem, I guess I'll read Pomegranate Seeds. Um, it's about the myth of Hades and Persephone um, in the 
Greek myth in the in the story in the Greek myth um Persephone is depicted is yeah she's depicted as this kind of a victim of of um kidnap and um, even in even rape you know and she's she's kidnapped by Hades the the lord of the underworld and she has to stay there she's punished in in the underworld and then later on she has to um visit the earth for, for six months of the year and then go back to the underworld for, for the rest of, of the year and it kind of seems like uh she's she is not the protagonist of her own story she's a victim and I really wanted to give her a voice a powerful voice because she is the queen of the underworld she has power and this is kind of my interpretation of of Persephone uh, pomegranate seeds this is swallowed them whole jewels that my body would hoard giving new meaning to the word chest for you to lift the axe and undress me rubies dripping down my legs I want someone you to want me as a means to an end a road less taken while you're down there, untangle the knot of besotted butterflies. They need not love in excess. They will inherit the spring I rob them of. That was ripped from me before I could scream about ruling two worlds, but owning neither. Hear me shudder an age too late. Am I a cold rose stripped of thorns? My petals shall flock too close to the sun. And while in pursuit of more treasures, you may be distracted by a goodbye note, a whirl of hair, the ghost of my mother's jewelry box, ballerina, twisting the night as your hand misses the doorknob moon just before your dust okay um the next poem i'd like to read is um about another queen this one is the red queen from alice in wonderland and this poem is just there's it's chaos there's a lot going on um I would kind of describe it as a as a chess game um where in which none none of the players are are kind of playing right they're making all the wrong moves um behind all the chaos however there is a serious story um it is about my life in 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 a, in, a, in many ways but it, there's just a lot of symbolism going on that um, it 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 kind is kind of covering a lot of of the truth because <clears throat> it's a bit of a contradiction. Sometimes I write because I want to confess something, but at the same time I don't want to give it all away because of the shame behind certain memories. Um, so so yeah, it's a bit of a confusing one, but this is uh the Red Queen. There the moon. Chasing time on a new high, the wool over its eyes, unhinged, wild, deserves a beating from her. Not wolf song, not my pinafore, tented up to my chin, for all woodland creatures to gawp at will sober it. Have the mirrors been whispering to you again? Perhaps a child or a hedgehog forced into a ball, flung by a flamingo, but never a woman I won't be. Lady, you must be joking. Certainly, a girl turned unhalal pig by the Red Queen. I came out to parade my body. She's always hungry for your head. 
white rabbit, weary father of my conscience, I see through your desperate lies, portals choking under the snow. I'll turn the key on her this time. My skirt is barricaded and my hat cuts throats. You're outgrowing my house. I was not spun from gold, but my mother's fallen hair. It's not easy to unravel me, harder yet to keep me still. Her arms under the snow know the scent of my neck. Father serves shards of a shoe with a note. Eat me. I've known her to shake with fury until her face is no more. And the next poem is, um, was requested by Jen. <laughs> it's called uh, Sunday Evening in the Heat Wave. And um, this is kind of a, a true story. Um, I, I actually believe this poem existed about this man who sounds like rain. And, and I, I was actually looking for this poem uh, everywhere, you know, in all my books, but I, I realized I didn't exist. <laughs> It, it, I actually um, made it up in my head and I think the weather had something to do with it. It was really hot and I, I think I just kind of went into a bit of a, a strange mental state. I don't know what you call it, but yeah, um, this poem came out of that. I know it sounds very strange, but, but there you go. Uh, Sunday evening in the heat wave. I find myself alone again hassling the bookshelf for a poem I once read about a man who sounds like rain. The train station at a somnolent hour, but cool, gives the girl an excuse to imprint the mud for the last time along metallic vertebrae. The city is a duct tape, taped hostage in the back seat of a car dashing through the nauseating choreography of a monsoon. Moisture and dust mask as petrichor and aura. At last, the cane under his arthritic guidance taps the rust, that voice, the crash of an urn. Uh. Of that. Um, I was wondering if anyone's got um, a request, if they've got the book, do, does anyone want me to read anything from any of these uh, poems stood out for you that you'd like me to read? Um, okay, <laughs> Moths of the Red Room, okay, all right. Yes, uh, so most of the Red Room uh, is based on the Red Room, which is a symbol used in uh, the novel Jane Eyre. And um, in the story, the young Jane Eyre is thrown into this Red Room in this in a stately home. There's this one room that's haunted um, by her uncle, Uncle Reed. And um, her aunt throws her in there to punish her and she, She's so overcome by fear that she collapses into a, a fit in in the in the book. And um, I use the idea of fear and uh, superstition to to um, to write this this poem um, because in religious communities superstition is 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 rife. You know, it, it's like sometimes you, you try to work out the, the the difference between you know religious beliefs and superstition and sometimes they're, they're just kind of so connected it's hard to tell them apart and um in in when i was growing up i was told that um moths be careful of moths because if they come near you the eye they can blind you which is you know not true but um yeah so so that's one of the examples i used here um and in my red room, 
there are moths and they are very sinister little creatures that um they have power of this magical tapestry and there's a tree and all the fruits are family members and my fruit is not good enough so here we go uh, moths of the red room passing round a flame we whisper of moths trembling in our night shirts whiter than ghosts if a moth touches your eye you'll go blind or worse you'll see nothing but red forever the red room operates in darkness so if you dare step lightly in case of wings graze the tapestry and glean from the textures nature's instinct needs no instructing one fruit for each one of us in the family the moths are needles needless of thread always stitching my fallen fruit back onto the tree my sisters joked that mine was troubled and overdue for the moths intense unpicking they locked me in the red room with my bad fruit. A keyhole shaped glow captured a moth, wings lust red, eyeless eyelids blinking senseless, scarred with embroidery, pearls like crystal balls, misting the future, then assaulted by tears. Okay, um, should I read one more? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm not sure which one. Um, which one? Oh, sure. A few requests for Jupiter Fox in the chat. Oh, right, yes. Sorry. Yes, Jupiter Fox. This uh, this poem is um, a strange one, really, because um, I was suffering from writer's block, and I I really wanted to write a poem about a fox. You know, I think all poets uh, go through a phase where they they just want to write a, a fox poem, or maybe that's just me. Um, and uh, yeah, so I decided to write about writer's block. <laughs> and a fox, <laughs> then this is what, what came out. Uh, Jupiter Fox. The coldest winter we knew, wind-like blades, never a dull moment between their embrace. Shredded bare parchment in a into a vertigo of seagulls. I watched you fall asleep, then stole out in search of fire to light the wood. My spirit fluent, but dragging its lump of meat. It wasn't down to you to deforest my mind. Ideas must be pared back, but I was conscious of you waiting. In your eyes, I'm gardening, snuffing glowing desire to plant ashes. When I blow away the clouds like charcoal dust, the universe isn't waiting for me anymore. Once, under an apple-heavy branch, I found my flame, a fox weary, wearing the storms of Jupiter, eyes of volcanic glass, wrapping the footpath around his paw, drew me closer to him. Confiding in me, I heard him say, if happiness isn't a bitter, bittersweet reward, it isn't happiness at all. Okay. Shall I read another one? Or... Okay. Should we, uh, let's, let's chat quick about the book um, and then maybe we'll finish on one more poem. Um, before, before I uh, thank you so much and I, for introducing the poems as well. Um, yeah, it's amazing to hear the background of them, which I'd not heard, and adds 
I'd say another layer, but perhaps even more than one other layer to the to the to the poems. And I had my fox poem phase as well, but we all grow out of it eventually. <laughs> Um, that I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I'm, I'm hoping that there's some thumbs up for people who've written a fox poem. Um, uh, I I was kind of that's kind of partly because I'm just intrigued, but I know this was this wasn't edited um, by me or Emma. It was edited by uh, our freelance editor Sahini Basak. Um, so I'd love to know how that process worked and and how you found it. Uh, it was great, yeah. Uh, working with Sahini, um, when I submitted the manuscript, uh, the poems were all jumbled. Uh, they weren't in the right order, and she helped me sort of. She helped me see the importance of of ordering your poems in, in a collection. As I said, I'm I'm fairly new to poetry, so for me, it's just like you know, put all these poems together and just you know, it's fine. You know, people will find the connection, but actually. There is a real thought process behind it. And um, she made me see that there are the, all these characters in this collection and they can all kind of, they're all related and and what needs to go before the other. Um, and and that, that was really, that was um, a learning curve for me. And it's, it's good. Um, in terms of actually just um, editing the poems, she didn't have too many corrections, uh, nothing that changed any of the poems, you know, drastically. The, the, they were pretty much, she was pretty happy with, with a lot of, with them. So, you know, in that sense, yeah, not much was actually changed in terms of the poems, yeah. Didn't do battle over any words. No, but I did have to get rid of a few poems that just didn't fit into this, um, yeah, this collection. And I totally agreed. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just so glad that one of the poems just didn't make it because I read that poem now and I think, oh, that's that's not good. That's not a good poem. <laughs> just that, yeah. that just needs to go in the bin, you know, that's <laughs> <not> it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how we can't see things for... A little while, and then when you do, you say, "Oh God, yeah." <laughs> yeah, no, you do learn a lot in the editing process. You know, it, it, being a writer, you're constantly learning. It's just, just never ends. So, yeah. Um, no. I meant to say, if anyone, if anyone has any questions that aren't my questions, <clears throat> please do put them in the in the chat. If we've got a few minutes left. Um, I did want to bring up this has been brought up already though I suppose as well but um I'd love to hear more about it because there's just this kind of love of books and reading in many of the poems the kind of I think probably I I read in your manuscript but there is something about then reading it in a book like holding it physically that brings it to the fore even more and that kind of sense of like the transformative power of reading and then you even said at the start today that Jane Eyre changed changed your life um so yeah, I'd I'd love to hear about your experience of reading, growing up, and and what you what you're reading then, and, and maybe what you're reading now as well. Yeah, um, well, I wasn't much of a reader growing up, really. I mean, I did read books, but you know, it was just kind of a um, it wasn't a passion for sure. I just read them, and um, it was it was when I read Jane Eyre that I really realised that the power of of the written word and how it can um cause you to to do things to change the way you you live your life even um i don't know it's, it's the way that she talks about um the spirit and you know that that there there is beyond the flesh there's there's within us there's a spirit there's a soul and we we have a purpose um and yeah that 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 also made me want to write that you know, and I, I started writing about a lot of what was going on in my own life. And um, I wrote stories. I wrote loads of kind of uh, fantasy based stories. Thing. Um, but yeah, I think 
the reader for the right as as a writer I, I realize that the reader is very very important you know as a writer you, you sort of do 50 50 percent maybe not even that of the work really is the reader that makes the the piece of writing what what it is you know when people talk of masterpieces a masterpiece is a masterpiece because of the reader the reader loved it and appreciated it and and called it a masterpiece you know and um yeah, as as readers, we we hold the power. We interpret things. We see things through our own lens, our lenses, and our everything is filtered through our experience. And we make a book what it is. And um, yeah, the in the name of red is a celebration of that. It's a celebration of of how we um, take a story and make it our own. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me of the one brilliant line in the art of cloying, which is really like um, about books. I'm not going to be able to find it now, am I? Um, I loved every page as they did, but a little, but a little differently. Yeah, that kind of sense that we're all, for whatever reason, reading slightly different. Um, there are characters in this. Georgia, uh, my colleague, asked about this because you're writing sort of towards characters and in like uh, in praise of characters I suppose um were there are there any books or, or characters that you would I uh, want to write against rather than write in response to <laughs> they yeah uh... against <laughs> yeah. um I don't know main question hmm I sort of the thing is when I read, even if when I read a bad the bad characters, even bad characters are so lovable, you know, because they do things that you wish you could do in a way. Um I was just thinking about, I don't know why Fight Club came to mind, you know, like Tyler Durden, you know, just so bonkers, you know. Um, but yeah, when I read Fight Club, I, I kind of I think that that was the first time I, I I I guess I just didn't like a character as much because of all the horrible things he was doing, not just to other people but to himself as well, just being really really self destructive. It's a very very dark novel, and I remember that having a sort of um, adverse effect in in the sense in in myself. I just you know when I read I I feel it in my gut, you know, and and. With a Fight Club, I think it was it, it's it's a it's a novel that I just um I did love the way it was written, but I just did not like the character as much as I liked other characters, and I guess I would probably write against Tyler Durden. Yeah, <laughs> there's a commission coming against Tyler Durden. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've got a question from from Ria. Um, uh, when did you know that these poems would be about the color red? Did you start with the theme or did you recognize it in the work you were already writing? Yeah, um, I, I didn't intend to write about the color red. I guess I was um, writing, I started off writing about Hades and Persephone and pomegranate seeds. And then I, um, but I was also writing about my family. And um, I remember thinking, I just want to be, brave in my voice I just I, I want this to be like a rebellion almost like rebelling against tradition and just wanting to be myself no matter the cost you know um in these poems so red sort of came the the poem red is red was was kind of written was the last poem to be written for this uh, collection because yeah, that was the last thing I, I kind of decided was that the unifying symbol would be red because it symbolizes, yes, there's that mythical aspect, there's, but there's also this kind of raw um, femininity, you know, in, in this in this collection, just to be emotional and unafraid, which it kind of aspects that are opposite to myself, just wanting to be something different and move forward. Um, despite any everything that's happened in, in the past, yeah. Well, yeah. Amazing to hear you say it in in that way, and I hope it sort of chimes with what I was saying at the start, which I, uh, yeah, 
in short, you completely achieved that aim, I think it felt, and it feels still now, uh, yeah, definitely brave and definitely sort of uh, an emotional truth to uh, to everything, even if we are obscured by um, what you're choosing to tell us in some of these poems. Um, it's a really beautiful piece of work and thank you again, for sending it to us. Um, we are approaching eight um, and uh, I'd love to hear another poem before before we finish. Um, uh, yes. So I, I'm i going to leave it to Zaina. So I'll do my little wrap up bits now and uh, we can end uh, on another poem. Um, my wrap up bits include you watching me copy and paste things that I'm putting into the chat. Uh, one of which, of course, is uh, Zaina's pamphlet. If you uh, haven't bought it already or haven't bought it for a friend already, um, then, then please do. Um, and please do, uh, if you are social medially inclined um, or, or otherwise, just uh, do tell people about the, the pamphlet. It makes a massive difference and, and we'd love to hear what, what readers uh, think and, and see photos of, of, of the books out in the world with readers. Um, uh, one more thing we've got coming up. If you uh, enjoyed this and enjoyed our on um, Zaina's work, please do sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already. We, so we'll, we'll tell you first about uh, any books and submission um, windows as well. Um, we have got an online masterclass that we do occasionally, this one with our, um, not now most recent uh, poet, but uh, uh, poet we published in, in January, Laurie Bolger, will be running a masterclass for us. Um, so uh, do take a look at that and get some tickets. Um, it just leaves me then to thank Jen and Ria for those amazing uh, readings and Ria for making me want to have dal for dinner. Uh, I do not have, uh, unfortunately. Um, and thank you all for joining and reacting um, uh, and your questions in the chat uh, and to Zaina for this uh, wonderful pamphlet and for your reading. And I'm going to leave it to Zaina to finish uh, and spotlight you once more um, and we'll see you all again soon. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, the last poem I'm going to read is called After the Trial. It's the last poem in the pamphlet. And it's just a, a poem about um, the afterlife, but it's also about saying goodbye, saying goodbye to the past and moving forward, um, taking all the experiences you've learned um, with you forward into a new aspect of your life. Um, yeah, so after the trial. Swaddled in red sky arms, colder than valley stone, starlight spearing to burn. My hands are tied as I walk the one-way dream to eternity, where starving ghosts shriek with the rising threads of rain. The shame tires me the most, tears too far to wipe away. Thank you.